Thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk. Um, I've known about ADVAC for 20 years, and I haven't managed to get here even once, so it, it's quite a big thing getting here after so long. And that's only because the person giving this talk every year has retired. <laughs> uh, so it goes to show how popular ADVAC is even among the faculty. But meningococcal disease, I will not have to tell you whatever part of the world you come from. It is rare, but everybody knows about it. It is an extremely severe infection uh, that begins very nonspecifically, but can kill you within 24 hours, despite whatever treatment strategies you use. So the only way to prevent the outcomes of meningococcal disease is through vaccination. The meningococcus um, is the leading cause of meningitis and septicemia. Most of you will have heard of the African meningitis belt, which is due to uh, meningococcal serogroup A. Uh, but it occurs everywhere in the world, and different serogroups are different. Uh, occur, uh, different serogroups are prevalent in different parts of the world. It is what is commonly known as an accidental pathogen. It, is, it doesn't want to make you sick or to kill you. It wants to live in your nasopharynx uh, and, and procreate and move to other people. Asymptomatic carriage has been in the past quarter to at around 10%. It's probably around 1% in most parts of the world, outside the meningitis belt, which is a, a completely different scenario. And even though we say it's uh, it's 10%, there is a very distinct uh, distribution of carriage where you have a little bit of carriage in the very young, and then you have a peak uh, carriage starting at around 18 years of age, uh, and then it declines over time. And this is really important because identifying the main carriage groups gives you a, a, an opportunity to intervene with transmission. Um, the risk factors are all associated with close physical contact, which um, in England at least begins very typically at 18, and you get this sudden surge because people from all over the world, the university students mainly um, move across England and from abroad and have very close interactions. So we do know that university and any shared accommodation settings uh, are a brilliant place for, for transmission of meningococcal disease. Meningococci are divided into serogroup. Each serogroup is very distinct based on a very unique polysaccharide capsule that surrounds uh, the meningococcus and they are individual to each serogroup. Six serogroups are responsible for almost all invasive disease across the world. Uh, in Europe, North America, and most of the other parts of the world outside the meningitis belt is the BCWY that cause infection, very little A and almost no X outside those settings. And the distribution is very geographical and it changes over time. So as I said, uh, as I said, you can see that A, C, W, Y, X are common here. It's most, well, used to be mostly A, but in other parts of the world, you have different serogroups. In Europe, it's mostly B and a little bit of C because of the vaccine programs. But the epidemiology changes. So if you're reading a paper on meningococcal epidemiology that's more than five years old, it's too old. Uh, this is our latest attempt with seven and a half thousand words to summarize the epidemiology, and that was back in 2020. So in another five years, we have to start replacing that because it will have changed again because of the bugs and because of the vaccines that are currently being used around the world. Um, and so, as I said, it's a vaccine epidemiology, it's a recommendations, and it's vaccine uptake in different parts of the world as well. That makes a huge difference. So where do we go from here? The early vaccines that came in in the early 1970s were simply a polysaccharide vaccine. You take the outer sugar coating of the meningococcus, you put it into a vaccine, and you get a polysaccharide vaccine. Now, I know that you've had a talk about conjugate vaccines and herd immunity yesterday, and this is a very classical example. If they didn't use MENC, then MENC could easily have been one of those vaccines where we learned about herd immunity. And the reason for that is the conjugate vaccines are different to polysaccharide vaccines because um, 
they're working very young infants and they have all the other advantages, but the other advantage is it induces herd, Im- it induces immunological memory. And probably the most important thing is that it prevents acquisition of carriage. So if you target the group that carries the meningococcus, you can break transmission and create herd immunity. And that was the whole context of the UK program, which began in 1999 because of a surge in men C cases in the in the early to mid 1990s. We started with an infant program at two, three, and four months of age, uh, and a catch up up to 25 years of age. You see two, three, four. You don't see a booster at 12 months. That's because we thought the immune memory created by the two, three, four month schedule would protect against further infections. But you heard in Australia uh, about the pneumococcal schedule yesterday. We learned about it in the 90s with HIB, where we had a 2-3-4 schedule, and we messed up our our program because five years on, we had a surge in HIB cases in, in toddlers and then in adults, and we had to implement a we had to implement a booster program for 12 months of age to give us the herd immunity. So all our conjugate vaccines have a booster at 12 months of age to give you protection against carriage and induce herd immunity. So once we had herd protection from three, four, and 12 months of age in September 2006, we were able to cut down the infant doses further. So we only had three and 12 months of age. And then we wanted to bring in the 13-year-old booster for uh, for teenagers so that we could eliminate carriage in teenagers and keep that herd immunity with fewer vaccines in the infant schedule. And you see this is the graph of meningococcal C disease. We had very rapidly increasing cases in the late 1990s, peaking in 1999. We brought in MenC vaccine and we saw a huge reduction in cases, both in the vaccinated cohorts under 25 and in the unvaccinated cohorts over 25 because of herd immunity. And when we did carriage studies done by some very famous people who are actually going to be on this talk, Martin Maiden, who's going to talk after me, um, what they did is massive, massive studies to show reductions from like literally very, very small numbers um, of two and a half percent to less than one percent after the vaccine, showing very clearly that vaccinating teenagers redu- resulted in reduction in men's C carriage in adolescence, which then contributed to the herd immunity. But this type of study needs thousands and thousands of adolescents to find such a, such a small reduction. So MEN-C was a very, very successful in 1999. And MEN-ACWI conjugate vaccines appeared around 2005, but very few countries really used it because there wasn't really a need to use a quadrivalent vaccine, which is clearly a, a lot more expensive than just a monovalent vaccine. And you needed something to trigger that to be able to use it. And in the UK, what happened is around 2009, 2010, we saw a huge surge in MEN-W disease. It was a national outbreak from a strain that had originated in South America. It initially got into adults and then spread rapidly across the UK, affecting all age groups. And it had the engine of men C, but the outer coating of men W. So it was a nasty infection with a high fatality and very severe complications in adolescents and young children. And because there were only 180 cases at the end, you couldn't start a program where you mass vaccinate everybody for 180 cases in a population of 55 million. So what we decided to do is a targeted vaccine program. We introduced, uh, we changed the men ACWY, sorry, men C to men ACWY at 13 and 14 years. Uh, and we had a catch up for 13 to 18 year olds. Our plan was to target the carriage group, reduce carriage, provide direct protection to teenagers who are vaccinated and then induce herd immunity as quickly as we could. Uh, And this is, again, the reason why we did that was because we wanted to catch that group before they went to university. That was our aim. And what you see is that within 12 months of the program, the increase in cases in the vaccine eligible group fell. So we had a direct impact immediately. And right next to it is the 20... 20 to 24 year olds where you, it continued to go up because they weren't eligible for vaccines. We only had six cases in vaccine eligible groups in this, in this cohort. None of them were vaccinated. These vaccines are very, very, very effective against invasive disease. And if you get 
conjugate vaccine failure in teenagers is usually because they have an underlying problem, either asplenia or more likely con um, complement deficiency. Uh, vaccine failure after ACWI conjugates in teenagers is extremely rare. And we've published this now. We have three years of data after male ACWI vaccine. And what you see is a huge reduction across the population of men W, which is the blue one, men Y, which is yellow, which is an added bonus, because if you look, men Y cases were creeping up year on year before the vaccine came in and they started going down. And men C, there were concerns that it was going up, but that has also settled with the program. So we get an extra benefit of the ACWI program simply for targeting the W strains. So one of the other things that happened in September 2015 is we introduced Bexero, Fosimen B, a protein-based vaccine against meningococcal B, and I'll tell you more about it. And we had some confidence that this vaccine would protect infants against other meningococci. And so what we were able to do subsequently is remove the three-month C, and we're going to remove the 12-month C. So our only meningococcal immunization program in the UK for ACWI is for teenagers and we're going to rely on the teenagers to provide herd immunity to the rest of the population. Okay, a little bit about the African belt. It's another level. The number of cases in the African belt are far exceed anything that you see anywhere in the world. You can see up to 200,000 cases in, in a bad season. Um, and many of you will have heard about Menafrivac and the meningitis vaccine project. Um, the vaccine was uh, first licensed in 2009, uh, qualified for use in 2010, and massive, massive immunization programs in that region uh, were implemented. We virtually eliminated meningococcal A disease. This is an example of CHAD, where the vaccine came in, uh, and basically the peaks that you were seeing every year just disappeared. Um, in first in one region and then the rest of Chad. And you could do this for almost every country that had a Menafrigan program. And it just gets rid of it. I mean, it was a huge campaign. It targeted a large age group of children and young adults, but it worked. And the fact that it prevents carriage also means that you benefit from the program for several years after the vaccine comes in because you just cut down infection, you cut out transmission. And therefore, even if you're not vaccinated, you'll be protected through herd immunity within that group. Again, some studies, uh, some nice studies showing a reduction in carriage, the pre-vaccine carriage of about 0.6%. And you can see that for meningococcal A, it virtually disappears in carriage and the other meningococci is still around. And if you look at this graph, this um, map of 2022, meningococcal A should be in red. And you can see there's virtually no A at all, indicating how successful this program has been in Africa. There's lots of excitement now because we are nearly there with a pentavalent vaccine, which is an ACWY with an X conjugate in it. This has the potential for literally eradicating meningococcal disease and meningitis uh, from the African belt once it is uh, once it's implemented. So where do we go from here? The ACWY conjugate vaccines have been incredibly successful in, in eradicating both uh, invasive disease and inducing herd immunities in the countries that have used this program wisely. The problem is that the conjugate vaccines provide no cross-protection to the other serogroups. And the big problem is meningococcal B. Now, the problem with developing a meningococcal B conjugate vaccine is that the sugar capsule on meningococcal B is very similar to human nerve cells. And that has two effects. The first effect is that um, you, it's not very immunogenic because the immune system thinks it's part of its own body, so it doesn't make a good immune response to it. And there's some animal studies and some theoretical concerns that if they do make antibodies, you could attack your own nerve cells and create autoimmunity. So most companies have moved away from trying to develop a meningococcal B conjugate vaccine. These are theoretical, uh, but nobody's going to touch it. And it took 20 years for Bexero to be developed. Bexero is a protein-based vaccine. They identified four major um, surface protein antigen, which covers a range of meningococci, but specifically targeted men B because there was no vaccine against it. 
uh, and these are surface express proteins, you develop very high antibodies that are bactericidal against this. And if your strain has got this antigen, then uh, you will be protected. But it's not designed to protect against 100% of men B strains. Yeah. So depending on circulating strains, it will depend on how much protection you're going to get. I'm only going to mention to remember once there is another men B vaccine, which is made with a recombinant factor H binding protein, which is claimed to be present in around 95% of men B. To remember, hasn't really been used at a national level. It has been used in outbreaks and has been shown to prevent invasive meningococcal disease, but it hasn't been used at a level that Bexero has, so we have very limited information. I'm going to focus on Bexero because that has a lot more data from many parts of the world, especially the UK. So if you look at men B in Europe, you will see that men B is the primary serogroup in most parts of Europe. And the coverage range is somewhere between 70% and, and 85%, depending on uh, the country. And also it depends on whether, these, whether the strains have one, two, or three antigens. We don't know what it means. We don't know which antigen is important. We don't know if you need two antigens or some combinations are better. What we do know is if you take the strains and test them against vaccinated uh, people, this is a level of coverage that we would get. So it was never going to eradicate main B. It was just going to reduce disease by about 70, 75%. So we were the first country to implement forcing main B into a national infant program. We published our three years data in 2020. And what you essentially see is that only the age groups that were eligible for vaccination had a reduction in men B disease. And they're small numbers, but the pattern is, the pattern is very clear. Like once you get two doses from 18 weeks all the way to two years of age, you see reductions in men B disease, but not in the other age groups. And we estimate around 75% of men B cases were prevented in those age groups. What we're also able to show quite nicely and actually quite intelligently is that it also protected against men W disease in children. But for that, what we had to do is we had to predict what the number of cases would have been without herd immunity in infants because we had an ACWY program at the time. And then we looked at the, the, the number of observed cases and we saw a significant reduction in men W disease in the infants. And you can look at it another way. And again, what you see is only the cohorts with at least two Bexeros had reductions in men W disease, showing the first evidence that this is not a men B disease, this is any meningococcus that has those antigens that are in Bexero, which is very important. What about acquisition of carriage? Because if it reduces acquisition of carriage, then you could use it in teenagers and create herd immunity like the conjugate vaccines. But that would be too easy because it doesn't. <laughs> so big study, 45,000 teenagers vaccinated in um, in uh, South Australia, randomized control trial, zero effect on men B carriage in vaccinated compared to unvaccinated. What that means is that if you want to be protected against men B disease, you have to be vaccinated, whether you're two months old or 18 years old. You need direct protection for vaccination, which is great for the company, by the way. Uh, just saying, it's not all bad news. But it does mean that you can't use it to, to create inducer immunity. But, you know, you get, you get lucky sometimes. So we used it in infants. We see a very clear indication of protection. Others have used it more widely. Portugal has a private system. Um, uh, the first one here is the South Australian study. They followed up the vaccinated and unvaccinated teenagers, and they see a 71% reduction in men B disease. And they saw no men B disease in teenagers who were vaccinated, which is incredible. Small numbers, but still incredible that they didn't have a single case. But they do have one men B strain that's circulating mostly. So it was very vaccine targeted in a way they were lucky. In Portugal, they have a private vaccination system. And anybody who got vaccinated, they did a case control study of zero to 20 years of age. And they found an 80% protection against men B disease, irrespective of the age. And they had some suggestion that actually, if you got vaccinated and still got um, men B disease or ACWY disease, you got less sequelae compared to unvaccinated. So maybe it protects against severe disease. This is my claim to fame. I wrote a paper which I called The Exciting World of Meningococcus. 
Lancer didn't like it and gave it, made me call it. <laughs> like, who is ever going to look that up? The only thing I would suggest is don't Google sex sighting. It takes you to some really dodgy websites. <laughs> but I mean, that would have attracted more attention than the paper itself. It's like a 30 page paper with tables and tables. And the reason it's exciting is that nobody thinks of meningococcus as sexually transmitted. But we do see outbreaks of meningococcus among people who have very close physical contact and MSMs, for example, and, and those groups where there is a lot of close physical, physical contact. You do see outbreaks of meningococcal disease, just like you would with any closed comp- environment. But what you may not realize is that the meningococcus is related to the gonococcus. And what they do is they share genes. And that's why it's exciting, because they have sex and change information. <laughs> and that's really important, because we have found evidence of men C, for example, acquiring genes from gonococcus, which allows it to survive in anaerobic environments. And then it becomes sexually transmitted, and it hides in the anogenital region and so on, and gets transmitted through sex, which is remarkable, but, I mean, opens up a whole new field for a pediatrician. Um, and we, we wrote this paper, am I pointing the wrong way? Uh, we wrote this paper and then we did some studies looking at meningococcal strains isolated from, from MSMs who had symptoms of gonorrhea. And we randomly did find meningococcus as a cause of endogenital infections in MSMs. And there are certain strains that are circulating that were really concerning to us because they were multi-drug resistant which again was acquired from gonococcus. So we started getting multidrug resistant meningococcus, which is virtually unheard of uh, among this MSM population. And it's not surprising that these two uh, uh, misbehave because they are very closely genetically related compared to all the other Nicerias. Um, and then what, was, what came after that was this idea that perhaps the outer membrane vesicles that were used in the original MEN-B vaccine, where you just take the outer membrane physical of the outbreak strain and make a vaccine out, out of it, could protect against gonorrhea. So in New Zealand, where they used an outer membrane physical vaccine uh, uh, three decades ago, they noticed over the 10 years afterwards, those who got the MEN-B OMV vaccine had 30% reduction in gonorrhea. So something in that outer membrane physical was also protecting against gonorrhea. Uh, which clearly they were looking for it because of the genetic relatedness, but I don't think they expected that. And there, and then they did some lab studies that also showed, that also showed that the antibodies from Bexero, which contains this New Zealand outer membrane vesicle, also, uh, protected against gonorrhea. And now there, there's at least half a dozen studies and a, and a, and a clinical trial, a randomized control trial, showing around a 30% reduction in gonorrhea in those who get Bexero, which is really exciting because even though you may not want to give Bexero to adolescents to protect against men B disease because it's very rare in adolescents, certainly this becomes a very exciting vaccine for, uh, for teenagers for protection against gonorrhea. This South Australian study where they did the randomized control trials of teenagers they found a 32% reduction in those who got Bexero in adolescence. So in the older age groups, you'd expect even bigger reductions in terms of number of cases prevented because of the rise in gonorrhea cases with age. I'm not going to talk to you much about it, but pentavalent vaccines are the most exciting fields at the moment. There is a forced Bexero with a MenACWY cream being developed by GSK as a pentavalent. And there is a Tremember with a MenACWYTT being developed for adolescents from Pfizer. Quick talk on, on the pandemic and effects of lockdown. We saw dramatic reductions in, in meningococcal disease during lockdown, which is not surprising. Uni- teenagers weren't allowed to go to university. They couldn't mingle. There were no parties. And meningococcal disease just literally went down in all age groups because they weren't getting infected. They weren't transmitting. So nobody was getting it. As soon as we came out of lockdown, we started seeing an increase. Almost all the increase was in men B, no, not, as, not as much as pre-pandemic, but it was going up. You can see AW, ACWY very well protected because of the herd immunity from the ACWY program that was running. And if you look at where this men B disease is, you will see the first place it starts always is in the carriage group. You get a lot more carriage and a few of them get very sick. 
in, in meningococcal disease, it's teenagers because they're the ones who are carrying meningococcal B. For pneumococcus, we saw it in one to four year olds because they're the main carriers. So where there's a lot of carriage, you will get accidental invasive disease. And that's your, that's your canary in the mind when you look, mind when you're looking at these, uh, infections to see whether it's going up or down. So just to conclude, meningococcal conjugate vaccines are remarkably efficient in protecting against an invasive disease. If you target the age groups, it's teenagers for adolescents, for meningo, it's, it's toddlers for pneumococcus, you can induce herd immunity and 80% of your reduction in disease will be in the non-vaccinated group because herd immunity is so effective. Protein-based vaccines are very exciting. They don't cover against all the strains, so they don't give you vaccine failure, and that's really important. They don't prevent acquisition, but they can protect against non-B. X0 also protects against gonorrhea. Tremember probably doesn't because it doesn't have OMV. They are different, so it's not men B vaccines. And new vaccines are two pentavalent vaccines. Uh, be careful when somebody says pentavalent vaccine, make sure you know which one they're talking about because they're confusing. Thank you. Thank you so much for a very nice talk about a complex subject. So we're open for questions now, if anyone has any questions. Given the really, I mean, you know, the public health uh, threat, actually, anyway, I will be clear from the U.S., uh, sorry. Uh, the public health threat associated with multidrug resistant gonorrhea, what role can the men be play? Because I think... Um, we heard yesterday about, you know, the, um, the possible impact even with a low effectiveness or efficacy vaccine in a large burden, uh, you know, um, a disease. So in specific risk groups, is there, do you see any role right now for a specific targeted vaccination or not yet? Not in any specific. This is a phenomenal vaccine for gonorrhea. We've never had a vaccine that works against gonorrhea. 30% is phenomenally huge for gonorrhea as a global threat of multidrug resistance. It is the way forward. Uh, I think this vaccine is a landmark uh, vaccine because this vaccine can now be used to make better gonorrhea vaccines. But when we get that, that's good. But 30% reduction, every modeling study will tell you that it is very, very cost effective, irrespective of your local gonorrhea rates. If you then start thinking about high risk groups, such as MSMs and uh, and like uh, sex workers and that sort of group where they have a lot of recurrent gonorrhea, it, it's a complete no brainer trying to use this vaccine. The problem is that it's not licensed against gonorrhea, so the companies cannot push it. And so health, health agencies like us are trying to push it, but again, it's not licensed, so we are fighting for an off license use. And I think what we need is somebody to use it. And then everybody else will start using it. So to answer your question is, it doesn't matter where you live, it works. There is a big question about the duration of protection. And that's the key question is if you're vaccinating at 14, which is where you want to vaccinate most adolescents, will it protect you from 18 to 25 or 18 to 30? We know that the antibodies after Bexera just literally shoots down within two to three years. And if that's the case, then you might want to vaccinate them later. But if you vaccinate them 18, we get 35% uptake compared to 80% uptake in 14-year-olds. So I think everybody's just waiting for that little bit more data on how long it protects for and then consider how best to implement it. But I wouldn't be surprised if this vaccine came in for protection against gonorrhea and the meningo then becomes a secondary outcome. Thanks for your great presentation. Like pneumonia, uh, we are in a mega group, we are also facing with a new cell groups or variants that can make, for example, uh, emerging uh, new that cause outbreaks or, for example, changes in disease pattern in the future. So what's your question? Uh, I mean that like pneumonia, we are uh, facing with new cell ah, types. Okay. So is there any, is there any vaccine pressure? Okay, it's it's a very difficult, it's it's not straightforward. So there's two bits. There's ACWY. Let's tackle ACWY. There is a feeling that this new W strain, which has the engine of C, but the outer coating of W, 
probably emerge because of vaccine pressure from C. So you're pushing C down so hard that the only way C could survive was to change its capsule, and it became W. So yes, but it's taken a very, very long time, and we don't see it all the time, not like pneumo, which is just crazy with serotype replacement. We see it a little bit. We never saw it with hip. So when we brought in hip vaccine, it just went away, and we didn't see replacement with hip. So it's unpredictable. Back zero is a little bit different because it shouldn't impact on carriage. So the UK is in a good place because it's the teenagers who carry and the infants who get the disease. So we're not affecting teenagers. We are not changing the, the, the infection dynamics of back zero, which in a way is a good thing. We are not worried about it. If you vaccinate teenagers, it's unlikely that it affects the carriage and therefore the carriage dynamics. So it's unlikely to create pressure. But what it does do is having a vaccine program changes the disease profile that you see. So you have to keep in mind. So, for example, if you have a child who gets men B disease after back zero, we know that the 40 percent, 60 percent of them have strains that are not back zero preventable. Before it was like 10 or 15 percent. So it's not driving disease, the bug changes but it does tell you that the, the infections that the children are going to get are likely to be not vaccine preventable. So, and the other thing it changes is it changes the age profile. Because if you start vaccinating at two and four months, our peak disease went from six months down to two months. So most of our cases happen at zero to one and two months now. And we need to raise awareness in clinicians that meningo is no longer an older infant disease. It's a younger infant disease because of the vaccine program. So it's little things like this that we're starting to learn. Any other questions? Do we have more people? Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm from Belgium, and when we were discussing the uh, potential introduction of Bex Zero, one of the um, concerns was that it's quite reactogenic, and yet another injection uh, that might not be um, accepted very well by the parents. So, do you have any uh, experience to share how that was in the UK? It protects against meningitis. <laughs> Every parent in the world wants a meningitis vaccine, and it doesn't matter if your child gets sick. It's meningitis, and that's why it gets away with it. If this was rotavirus, it would never make it. But it was very clear. It is reactogenic. We give it with paracetamol prophylaxis in infants at two months and four months of age, so they get paracetamol at the time of vaccination, and then they get Bexera with their routine vaccines. Um and there are some cases of reactogenicity. It was all about messaging and information. So parents were genicity and were able to deal with it. We told them it's only for 24 hours and it gets better. And if you're worried, seek help. We didn't see a lot of problems with the program. It didn't interfere with the program. We had 94% uptake in infants. And if you go to Mumsnet, which is a really useful safety surveillance uh, website, you hear stories about mom saying, gosh, my child was really poorly after back zero, but you know what? It was a rough night, but at least we know they're protected. So, yes, it is reactogenic. Paracetamol makes a huge difference. Not only does it reduce reactogenicity from back zero, it actually reduces reactogenicity from all the vaccines being given at the time. So the infants have a better experience. Um, what you can do is separate the vaccines. But so give routine vaccines in one uh, two months and then give the other bacteria at another time. But what you find is that actually when you add up the reactogenicities of the two separate episodes, it adds up more than a single episode with two vaccines. So it's false logic to split the vaccines, thinking that you're going to get less side effects. It actually you end up two events with side effects, and therefore you end up with more side effects. But it's really not been an issue. Yeah, uh, hi, it's Cristiano from Italy, and uh, I work at GSK, and I just wanted to say that pyrogenicity is the main problem associated to OMV normally, and OMV also protects highly against Gono and other things, so, you know, I, I think I wanted to reinforce what you're saying, and also the double vaccination <laughs> basically what? is not addressed by OMV, right, so... Two things. Since you're a GSK, I'm going to push you on that. <laughs> um, one is pyrogenicity isn't the big problem because if you give paracetamol, it's fine. They get really sick. They cry. They're vomiting. They become pale. Some of them have had seizures. It's, it's not, pyrogenicity is very easy to look after. 
baby, you know, parents don't go, my child is whole time panicking. They go because their child is not waking up. Their child goes blue. Their child actually is crying nonstop. Their child is vomiting. Their child gets diarrhea. Those, that's what comes with the reactogenicity. So the parogenicity is very simple to deal with. You know, it's these febrile seizures that they get that really is concerning. Mm. So it's that messaging that we have to get. It's very, very rare. When it happens, it scares the hell out of parents. Mm. And the protection against gonorrhea is not important for infants. So it's not even an issue, but. It was yeah, th thank you. V very good talk. Alpha Jalo from, from Insamplars. I'm here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was wondering, I, just uh, based on experience we have accumulated from the adult STI clinical trial, mostly on Bexero impact on gonorrhea. We, we well know there is an issue about antimicrobial resistance and a possible impact on microbiota also. Do you have any data on this uh, population in terms of? Uh... So we, we don't. We were about to start a trial in MSMs and uh, pandemic happened and it completely went out the window. But there's at least five different studies now that have looked at MSM and STIs. Uh, and outbreaks and demonstrated a significant reduction in gonorrhea infections. I haven't seen any people looking at antimicrobial resistance per se, but you can imagine that if you have 30% less infections, there'll be 30% less antimicrobial use. But whether the vaccine impacts on the transmission of vaccine, vaccine, uh, sorry, antibody, antibiotic resistance strains, uh, I don't know where they target some strains more than others. I think that will come with time. Somebody has to use it first. Thank you once again for that wonderful presentation. So, um, if I remember correctly, I think during the talk on pneumococcal vaccines, we are told that it could have indirect effects on nasal carriage for some viruses. Do you have a similar experience with uh, meningococcal vaccines? Yeah. Thank you. It's the wrong age group, right? So, okay, so it's the wrong age group because it's the teenagers who are carrying the meningococcus compared to the young children who carry a combination of viruses and bacteria, mostly pneumococci. Uh, and you have to remember that if you're looking at population impact on transmission or herd immunity, you have to look at the carriage group. Yeah, so this is somewhere between 18 and 21 years of age. So viruses play less of a role, but also they must do some, must have some role. So you do see an interaction between meningococcus and influenza, for example. But what nobody really has studied enough of it outside the very young age group. So it's unlikely in this age group to have much of a difference in terms of, of teenage carriage disease and transmission. The pneumococcus is more for infants and toddlers where there are very complex interactions. More questions? There were some over here earlier. Oh, go ahead. Uh, it was a actually very good uh, presentation. I just actually, I somehow I got the answer, uh, like he, he was asking, it was a similar kind of question. In India, we are giving Japanese encephalitis vaccine. So I just wanted to know if there is any cross protection of Japanese encephalitis vaccine towards many gogokal disease. I would think that's highly unlikely. Okay. I can't see how that might be related. Um, one thing, while you, somebody's trying to raise it, and one of the things, I mean, one thing nobody mentioned is, is costs. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a very, very, well, it's, a, it's a very expensive vaccine compared to many other vaccines that are being used. And it is very, very difficult to justify co health financial use for such a vaccine uh, because it is extremely rare, but it's extremely severe. And the way we calculate health costs does not really accommodate for that um, because um, you, when you look at the balance of things, even though it's a rare disease, the in, even if the outcomes are severe, the cost of vaccinating so many people to get such a small effect is often not justifiable. And the UK, for example, when this vaccine was licensed, the UK essentially said this vaccine will not be cost effective at any price 
in any age group. That means zero. Give us a vaccine for free and we still wouldn't use it. <laughs> yeah. Partly it was bad luck because disease rates have been falling since 2000 and we, it's just natural trends. Some people say it's cessation of smoking. Some people say it's natural trends, but cases have shot down since 2000 for whatever reason it is. So by the time the vaccine was licensed in 2013, disease rates were very low and falling at the time. But because of a lot of pressure from parents, from health professionals, from charities, a lot of politicians got involved. We were asked to redo the modeling of the vaccine. We optimized all the parameters, hoping that it was the best vaccine that it protected against 88% of strains. The uptake would be extremely high. There would be very little vaccine uh, failures. Um, we added values to, to accommodate the severity of the disease. And one of the other things we did was remove one of the infant doses. So instead of the license three plus one, we costed a two plus one schedule to bring the cost down by 25% of the program, even though it was off license. And having done all those adjustments, we came up with a price of seven pounds per dose for the vaccine. We said, if we can get the dose for seven pounds, we could use it in our program. The vaccine costs 75 pounds per dose. And so they went into this room, the dark room, and a year later, they came out and said, the vaccine is in. And so we don't know how much it costs. It's not public domain. You would think it's not near 75 and it's closer to seven. There's a lot of complex risk adjustments that they do in the program, but they were able to bring the vaccine in. And in a way, UK was a little bit lucky because we have really good surveillance. It was in the interest of the companies as well. That if you have good surveillance and you can show that the vaccine works and you can take the program forward, but there's a lot of negotiations going on, but you can see how seven pounds and 75 pounds goes for a country that is actually a high income country. Now imagine trying to do it for a country where there's very little surveillance, where you don't have a full disease burden, you can't do the costing. It becomes really, really difficult. And I think that is the big challenge and it's not, it's not, this is one, 20 years, that's almost a billion dollars of investment to make this vaccine. You've got to recover it. It's not their fault. Second thing is the vaccine is really hard to manufacture. It's not a conjugate vaccine where you have a platform. You know, it, it's a very complex antigen that to manufacture. So they can't give it cheap. So, you know, hopefully with the next generation of vaccines, we can find a balance that's closer to the middle. Uh, and so that more countries are able to use it. But gonorrhea is certainly the way forward, I think. Okay, uh, we'll go with Rita. Yeah, no, thank, you. thank you for that comment. And I, I think it's a really important point because I, I remember the, um, the men B vaccine licensures in the, in the U.S. And that was like, you know, around the time where it was provided compassionately for the university outbreaks and, and it stimulated a lot of like emotions. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> and in the U.S., we don't give pediatric doses of men B. But normally, I, I think the epi is the same between the U.S. and the U.K. What, what makes it's European men B? It's completely different. It's different, yeah. You don't have men B. Yeah, yeah. And yet you use, probably use as much vaccines as we do because you can. Yeah. It, it's, yeah, it's the same thing. The U.S. will give anybody anything that moves with any vaccine that's available. <laughs> um, yeah, literally. Uh, and, that, you know, it, it, it's... It's, I mean, you know, when you, when you come to COVID, it'll be even more exciting. But the, the epidemiology is completely different. There is genuinely very little men B disease in North America. Uh, there is uh, very little uh, need for a men B vaccine in infants because you just don't get a lot. There is a little bit of men B in university age groups in very, very small clusters. Mm -hmm. But in no other country in the world, would it justify a decision between the clinician and the family to vaccinate a teenager in the U.S. because the incidence rate is so low? So the fact that it is being used and the fact that all the teenagers are getting it is mind-boggling, but it's just because you're a rich country. Okay, one last question up there. I think you had a question. Did you have a question? Yes, thank you. I had a question. My name is Esther from Kenya. I'm just wondering, after you did the campaign, I'm right here. <laughs> After you did the campaign in the meningitis belt in Africa, have there been a resurgence of other subtypes of uh, men, men, 
meningitis. And yeah. then number two, I think I missed it. You said that this this man B has cross reactivity with the uh, nerve cells. What technology do you use to make it a little bit less virulent? Thank you. Me- less. Less like reactive to the body, so that you don't. Ah, okay. So your first question is yes, there were outbreaks of men eggs, uh, and some places have they have seen a resurgence of C, and that's why they are targeting a. Uh, ACWYX to try and cover most of the serogroups that cause meningococcal disease. That for some reason, there's very little men B disease in the meningitis belt. Uh, but certainly, so the two things happen, right? If A is up there and you bring A down, then everything that's down below then gets amplified. So what happens is that the proportions tell you that there are all these different serogroups, but actually they're like 10% of what it was with men A there at the time. But if you're going to try and eliminate and you remove the big peaks, then whatever's left at the bottom is what you have to target. And these tend to be C, there's some W, there's some X as well. Uh, y in general is not a nasty infection. So generally W and Y is like an old people's pneumonia. It doesn't really cause severe meningococcal disease. If you see a child or a teenager with W and Y, it's because there's something wrong with their immune system. But the W that came out of South America was a very nasty W. It's behaving like a C, so it's changed that picture. But C, W, and X can cause very nasty meningitis outbreaks, and therefore the ACWY X will probably be able to eliminate all that in the meningitis plant. In terms of reactogenicity, they, they, they did start making the vaccine without the OMV component, but it wasn't very immunogenic. The OMV component, the closest I can tell you, is like the um, uh, the whole cell pertussis compared to acellular pertussis. It irritates the immune system. So not only does those little antigens in OMV trigger an immune response, but by irritating the immune system, you get better responses to the other antigens in the vaccine. It's almost like an adjuvant. And in a way, they're lucky they did because it's the OMV that probably protects against gonorrhea and, and therefore gives a new life to this vaccine. So you don't want to make it less reactogenic. You just want to deal with the reactogenicity. Great. I think Keith has a comment. So just a clarification. Um, one of the questions was, you, someone said that pneumococcal conjugate vaccine prevents viral infections. And I can understand why people may be confused, but it doesn't prevent viral infections. It does prevent viral-associated pneumonia, which is associated with a number of viruses, RSV and flu, but what we think is happening there is the virus actually leads to secondary pneumococcal pneumonia. And so the pneumococcal vaccine is stopping the the progression of these viral pneumonias with a bacterial secondary infection due to pneumococcus, and that's what brings them into the hospital. So although you don't see the pneumococcus, you only see the virus, the bacterial vaccine is protecting against the bacterial disease uh, that is associated with the virus, not that, that a bacterial vaccine prevents viral infections. I, I purposely didn't answer that because I didn't want to move away from meningo because pneumo is a whole talk on its own. <laughs> but it is really, really important. And the reason I'm telling you is that there are papers coming out in the literatures which, in my opinion, are misleading, where they are claiming that by giving a bacterial infection, you can reduce viral-associated severe disease and hospitalization. So giving pneumococcal disease reduces influenza-associated pneumonia or COVID-associated pneumonia, which is probably not true. There's just no scientific basis for that. What it does is you get some people who go in and you find the flu, but you don't find the pneumococcus. And what these vaccines do is they eliminate those cases. So it looks like flu pneumonias have gone down, but actually it's not. It's knocking out the secondary pneumococcal infections that you don't find that are associated with the primary viral infections. So do be aware of the literature, because I've seen a few of these papers coming out recently. Pneumococcal vaccines do not prevent COVID pneumonias. I mean, 